Baruchim Aboyim. The uh, topic tonight is something that uh, we're all involved in, uh, work. And the real question with work is, it is a blessing or is it a curse? Uh, it seems like people, A, complain about it all the time. And not only that, our objective in work seems to be to retire. So is work... Uh, something more than a necessity, and is it a mitzvah? Is it something that the Torah demands of us and uh, requires that we do? So in the Torah it says, and we you say the words in the Kiddush um, in the morning on the Shabbat, so says, six days a person should work. You do all of your labor. And the uh, seventh day is the day of rest, the day of Shabbat for God, Lord our God. So we see here, again, a connection of working six days and then the seventh day of rest. And also in the Havdalah, at the end of the Shabbat, we say that in the Havdalah that we see the distinction between Yom Hashvi, L'Shesh Me'amasa, between the seventh day and the six days of work. So... We see in the Torah there's an uh, allusion to this that not only is it a mitzvah to keep the Shabbat, but Sheshisham and Tavo, but a person should actually work for six days. So how does that become a mitzvah? And what makes, it's actually, it's interesting that one of the things that makes the Shabbat so special is the fact that we work six days a week. Uh, it's, in a sense, an escape mechanism, a way to get away from the world, um, no matter how good or bad your week is the Shabbat forces you if it was good do it again um, there have been times I remember I was building a store and everything was coming down around my ears and it was Friday afternoon and I turned to the contractor and I said goodbye and he said to me goodbye he says you can't leave I said yeah I can leave you know he said but everything is in a turmoil here I said well I'll have to wait you know because it's the Shabbat and I have to go and that's it and many times that, you know, we know we have a problem and um, we can look at it and we know we're doing something wrong. We just can't find it. But the Shabbat is that which allows us to take a break, come back at it fresh, and in two seconds we find it. And if we would just stand there and do the thing, we'd have the same mistake over and over again. So again, so the idea of work then is something that makes the Shabbat more special. Again, because we see it as a real gift to spend time with our family. Because work takes us away from all of that. No matter what kind of parent you want to be, no matter how much time you want to spend with your wife and your children, uh, and recreating. You just don't have the ability to do so. Because work forces you to become involved. So again, so is it a blessing or a curse? So work is not only a necessity, but it's really a mitzvah, a good deed. How's that? The last word in creation, the last three words are Sherbara Elohim Lasos, which translates to mean which God made Lasos to do. That this world, there are four worlds that we believe, according to Kabbalah, the world of emanation, the world of creation, the world of formation. And this world is the world of Asiya, which you say is the world of action. That in this world, thought is not enough. In fact, thought many times becomes the, the, the tool of the side of evil. He'll let you talk about being good. He'll let you think about it. But action only becomes relevant once you do the deed. If you, you can think about eating matzah for eight days, if you don't put a piece of matzah in your mouth, if you don't do the action, you haven't fulfilled the mitzvah. So this is a world of action. And God, in a sense, gave us a real blessing. Well, and before that, not only that, um, when a person ends his life and goes before the heavenly court, amazingly, the first question that's asked is, were you honest in business? This becomes the first thing, which is strange, but that we see, it's, that's how hard it is to make an honest living, for a person to do what he needs to do. And how does a person do that? We learn, it's interesting, the Torah does not necessarily say it directly, but we learn out from both Yaakov and Yosef, and we know that Yosef was a reflection of his father, Yaakov, 
Torah tells us that Yaakov worked for Laban, a immoral, a uh, swindler, a person who was not honest. And yet, the Torah testifies that Yaakov says that he worked from day and night, and hot and cold. He did whatever he did what he had to do, being his uh, shepherd, taking care of the sheep of Laban, and Laban prospered. Even though Laban was not honest with him, that did not change the fact that he was honest and showed up for work every day, hot and cold, did what he had to do. We see with the story of Yosef. Yosef is sold into slavery. First, he's a slave, and he becomes the head of Potiphar, his master's household. A slave generally, when a slave first gets a position, he's a field slave. Yosef was the head of the house. To move into being a house slave, is already a, a sign of importance. And he ran, as he told Potiphar's wife, he ran everything. Everything was under his control. And then we see that Yosef is then incarcerated. He's put in prison. And again, his work ethic is there. And he's put in charge of the prison. And then Yosef is made the viceroy. And again, he has a work ethic where he's the one who knows whether the brothers come to Egypt or not. He oversees everything. He is very much involved. He's relevant in everything that happens. And this becomes the importance of being especially a person, but especially an Orthodox Jew, because for some reason we have a stigma in the world of being lazy, of being slick, uh, of, of taking shortcuts, which is Achil Hashem, the greatest sin you can do. It's our job. Orientals are seen as being hardworking. We're seen as smart, but not necessarily hardworking. And it becomes incumbent upon us to change that perception because the Torah demands it of us. If a person follows the Jewish law, the truth of the matter is you cannot be on your cell phone at work. That's stealing. The man pays you for X amount of hours. And if you're on a cell phone and he, you're being paid, you're actually taking money. If you take a long lunch, if you come to work late, all of these things are not only a black mark as far as your work ethic, but they're also forms of stealing, just as if you had taken money from the person. So work becomes a real test in how we follow this command that God has given us, because it means in a pristine form for us to, to work and to work with a work ethic that says that we are God-fearing, and that we're honest and that we're going to give someone an honest day's work, if anything, more than the person asked for, to show that we are people that, that have values. And this idea of working is really God wants us to be a partner in creation. And again, to make the world better. That we see that when Adam, when Adam was first created, first man, that Saturday night after the sin and Adam was taken out of the Garden of Eden. But God showed him how to make fire, which is creative, and how to crossbreed a donkey and a horse to, take, to bring something new into the world. And look at the amazing world we have, that it's not that we were supposed to take what God gives us and then leave it there. God expect us, expects of us to take this inheritance that he's given us and make it grow. And what we have by that is really God gives us the ability and the, and the opportunity to have a sense of pride, a sense of achievement. Since it's interesting, the Gemara says that a person would have, rather have one bushel of his own wheat than 10 bushels of someone else's. I mean, when was the last time you walked into a supermarket and they were out of tomatoes? I'm sorry, sir, we have no tomatoes. <laughs> it doesn't happen. There are always tomatoes. Sometimes they're nicer than others, but they're always available. And yet people go through great pains, spend a lot of money, and they plant their own tomatoes. And they really have so many tomatoes, they have to give them away. And when they give them to you, there's such pride. They say, you got to taste this tomato. And you taste the tomato, it tastes like a tomato. But to them, it's gold because they did it, that sense of pride of what it is. And this is what God gives us the ability to be a partner with him in creation by being involved in a job, something, and as we say, people suggest make your hobby your job, that do something that you like. You know, what people look at many times is where am I going to make money? Well, it's interesting. I happen to like food. 
Um, I was on my way to be a lawyer. I went into the restaurant business. And I really didn't think I'd make a lot of money. Meanwhile, I made plenty of money and many, many benefits. Newspaper articles, on and on and on. It's amazing because I did what I liked. I did what I wanted to do. I did what made me feel good, something that fit me. You know, it's like putting on a jacket. It's got to fit. Even if it's a beautiful jacket, but if it's too big or too small, it doesn't look good. Sometimes you can go into a store and buy actually a cheaper jacket, but if it fits you, it looks good. Then that becomes the key, that you need to find something that makes you feel good, something that allows your talents, because we all have them, to grow, to be fruitful. You know, there's, we even learn from the Torah that the priest, the, uh, the Levites that served the priest in the temple, they were trained for five years at the age of 25, and at the age of 30, they went into service. And from there, we learn out, the Gemara says that if you tried something for five years, it's not successful, try something else. You don't have to stick with what you have. And failure shouldn't be that which dissuades you from what you do. Henry Ford went bankrupt five times, Hershey, Hershey, Pennsylvania, bankrupt five times. If you like something, if you have a desire for something, if you're driven, it'll work. And anything can make you money. But more than money, how much money does a person need? And that's the real question. But happiness, happiness is not something that you buy. It's not like rich people are happy. That's not true. Because again, he who has 100 wants 200. He who has 200 wants 400. Rich people, for the most part, many of them, for the most part, are working and working hard. And they become slaves to the dollar. When it talks on that dollar bill and it says, in God we trust, that is the idol of today. In God we trust the dollar. And they work themselves to death to never really get to enjoy what it is. Because the work becomes that which the devil uses as a tool. By giving them money so that they don't spend time with their family. They don't spend time with God. They don't spend time with themselves. They're so consumed by the work. So you have both sides of it. And again, even... You know, there's two, Gemara says the two things it's hard to be is an ani, a poor man, and an usher, a rich man. Common denominator. Time. What do you do with it? And what work does is it doesn't give us time to sin. It keeps us busy. It keeps us fulfilled. It makes us feel good about ourselves. It makes our children look at us and respect us. And that we set this example of getting up every morning and doing, not because we want to, necessarily because we know that's what we should do it's the right thing to do and by doing that no pain no gain it's like working out once you finish up and you've done a good day's work you feel a sense of achievement it's funny a lot of people like working with their hands carpenters and things because it's nice to see something that you've made and this becomes something to see it's funny i make deli trays i hate to see somebody eat it because to me it's a work of art <laughs> but i understand and i you know it happens but again, but even a, a woman, if a man marries a woman and she's very wealthy, again, the halacha is that she has to do some things for her husband, even if she has servants. Because a person who's not busy, a person who's not involved, will not be happy and will not feel completed. And this is important. We were brought into this world to be creatures of action. And it's important that each one of us understand that. So what is, what is work? A blessing or a curse? And the truth of the matter is like everything else in life, depending upon how you handle it. But the opportunity, and God puts it before us, is for it to be a blessing of blessings. When a person works and he has in mind that I'm doing this to support my family, to be able to live a, a, a good kosher life, for me to be able to own things and be a kiddush Hashem, and, uh, to, be, to make God's name look good in the world, in all that I do, so before he does anything, if he says and thinks that, every moment that he spends at work is a mitzvah. And when people look at him and they see, especially if he's wearing a yarmulke, and they see how he takes care of himself, how he speaks, how he deals with people, the respect and, and the fact that he's, his lips are moving when he comes out of a bathroom, before he puts food in his mouth, all of these things, you become a light, a candle in an extreme darkness that lights up the world. And again, we need to know that work is an opportunity in so many ways for us to grow and make the world grow. And again, we should let the world see what gifts we have and use them. And at the same time, we need to be that light in the secular world to light up the world, to bring godliness within it. Again, thank you for coming. God bless and have a good Shabbat.